Okay, I'd like to call the Committee of the Whole budget meeting of December 11th, 2019 to order. I'd like to begin by reading a safety notice. In the event of an emergency, please evacuate council chambers to the nearest exit through the chamber doors and obey all instructions given and, and if assistance is required, please see the clerk. And tonight, clerking is Rebecca Mackay. Rebecca, raise your hand in case of an emergency. We will follow you like the Pied Piper outside. Once you've evacuated the building, please gather in the front parking lot outside of Town Hall. Please note Town of Lincoln Committee and Council meetings are posted on our YouTube channel. I'd like to thank the public for attending the meeting this evening. And I just want to remind everyone of our rules for engagement to please be respectful while others are speaking and to please refrain from clapping. Please remember to silence all cellular devices. Um, Councillor Renjima is absent tonight. Um, She's tending to her daughter. And any declarations of interest? I see none. We've got a bunch of staff in attendance tonight. Welcome staff. Thank you for coming. So tonight is the final budget meeting and deliberations, theoretically. We will start with a recap of our budget deliberations to date, including capital and water wastewater. As requested, staff have worked extremely hard over the past week to trim operational budget without affecting service delivery. The CAO, Mr. Kirkopoulos, will be reporting back on those final adjustments. The budget this year, as always, must reflect the needs of our growing community. We appreciate the work done to date by staff on the 2020 operating and capital budget. As we do our final deliberations this evening, I want to remind Council that Lincoln remains one of the most affordable communities in Niagara. Our financial well-being is sound with our long-term borrowing well below internal external policies. And a recent assessment by the province reaffirmed our financial indicators are in good shape. We are a growing community that will reap the benefits of new and improved infrastructure and knowing that the long-term advantages far outweigh the costs incurred by the municipality. You'll see some important statistics tonight about the value of growth to our community. As I've echoed over the last few meetings as a council, we must remain committed to address budget pressures while balancing the needs to build a solid foundation for our town. I ask that council keep factors in the forefront when deliberating this evening. And just a salient point I want to bring up before Mr. Kopoulos starts is that um, $100,000 in the budget is worth an impact of $2.65 per household. So if you're looking to trim anything, that's the effect it will have per household. So there are no statutory public meetings on the agenda. Delegations, we have none. Consent agenda, we have none. So regular agenda, we are now considering item 7.1, approval for the 2020 operating and capital budget. Mr. Kirkopoulos will be providing us a presentation. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good evening to members of Council. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to share uh, this information with Council as we uh, hopefully uh, round up uh, this year's budget process. Uh, and so I will make a few comments uh, about that towards the end and maybe uh, some things that we can uh, expect moving forward uh, because I think our goal is always to uh, uh, better how we communicate, better how we share this information. Uh, and, and better uh, how we provide uh, the public a glimpse uh, into the operating and capital budgets uh, for the town. So just a, a quick recap of uh, tonight's agenda. Uh, it will be uh, a recap of where we're currently sitting at, uh, followed by council inquiries. Uh, like we do every year, we will share tax levy scenarios uh, and then move into uh, next steps. So a little bit of a recap in terms of uh, where we're sitting at. Uh, the upper part of this particular slide uh, is uh, project spending uh, based on the uh, categories uh, that we often break our projects into. And as you can see there, the lion's share falls into the environment and safety. Uh, that is our water, wastewater, uh, and uh, other uh, elements of that. Uh, transportation uh, is at 31%, followed uh, by our social infrastructure and then corporate infrastructure. And of course, our long-term borrowing charges are included in there. Uh, the slide at the bottom uh, is our capital tax levy uh, and where that currently sits uh, and the various elements uh, and funding sources uh, comprising that capital tax levy. 
Our next slide uh, is a budget recap as it relates to the water and wastewater rates. Uh, and once again, uh, this highlights the new model that Council approved a few years ago. Uh, we will be looking at this again uh, following the completion of the four years. Uh, this did begin in 2016 uh, as per the water and wastewater rate study. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we have both a variable uh, rate as well as a base fixed rate. Uh, and the increases uh, to our water and wastewater rates uh, are on this particular slide. Uh, we are seeing a increase uh, on the base in the amount of $9.60 uh, for wastewater and $10.40 uh, for water. Uh, that is a total of $20 uh, or uh, five cents uh, per day uh, for water and wastewater services. A little bit of a recap in terms of uh, some of the tentative budget commitments to date in terms of where we're sitting. Uh, Council will recall uh, we spent uh, a number of uh, meetings talking about our capital budget and the various items within our capital budget and the associated funding sources uh, as well as the 30 projects that are included. Uh, and as you can see, our capital, bless you, our capital budget levy impact is at 1.59%. Uh, there is also uh, identified there a special infrastructure levy of 1.5%, which is tentatively the direction council gave in terms of uh, that special infrastructure levy and putting those monies uh, into reserves uh, for future needs. Uh, that does leave us with a total capital commitment of 3.1%. So moving forward uh, to levy percent and household impact and really a little bit of the analysis in terms of where we're at. Uh, the chair uh, highlighted a couple of the things that are in this presentation uh, in his comments, uh, and, and that is uh, that 1% uh, equates to about $4.37 on the tax bill. We're often asked uh, to go back to look at uh, cuts, and those are important things that we need to do. Uh, what that means in terms of uh, an impact to the tax bill is highlighted there. Uh, you know, the point there is that uh, ultimately we're always looking at final dollar impact. We're looking at what that means to the taxpayer. Uh, and of course, uh, council, uh, you know, has wanted us and continues to want us to look at balancing that with affordability. I think the last point on there is simply looking at Lincoln's portion uh, does account for one third of the tax bill. Uh, that is by no means an excuse, just a recognition uh, that we are only one third of the pie uh, and the other half of the pie is made up of uh, Niagara region uh, and uh, a little over 10% uh, made up through education uh, and waste management. So value uh, of growth to our community. We spent the last number of meetings, both from a planning perspective as well as budgets, talking about growth, talking about a growth budget. We are uh, one of a handful of municipalities in Niagara that experiences double-digit uh, growth impacts. Uh, and I think we've uh, we received direction in the past, but you know I suspect we're also gonna have some conversations this evening on, on what does growth mean? Uh, what does it mean from the perspective of forecasting? How does impact fit into that? And so I look forward to uh, any of those conversations or questions. But when we look at uh, our construction value, you've seen those slides uh, throughout the last number of months. Our construction values doubled since 2017. Uh, there still does require the cost that the municipality incurs uh, for the maintenance and operation, as well as the service delivery associated uh, with each uh, project we bring forward uh, and, and the economic value that these uh, bring to our community. So when you look at um, Niagara, and again, just some statistics for council consideration, uh, new home construction and economic impacts, uh, the source here is Stats Canada and the Niagara Home Builders Association. Uh, Niagara as a whole has seen about 1,800 new housing starts. That equates to about $323 million in wages and $778 million in built investment value. Uh, and so I think, again, when we talk about growth and what does it mean, those are those general statistics across Niagara. Uh, again, uh, based on StatsCan and the Niagara Home Builders Association and those uh, pieces of information, Lincoln uh, is about 29 to 30% uh, of this construction. And so if you were to do the, the math uh, as it relates to what is the economic uh, impact to our community, and these are you know, the secondary things we see 
These are uh, those tertiary companies that supply uh, services and goods. Uh, these are people spending money in our downtowns. They're people spending money in our grocery stores and so forth. You can see that that equates to about 90 million in wages that show up in purchases across the entire local community uh, and $200 million in building family wealth. So in other words, people buy homes, they get mortgages, uh, and there is a wealth building that occurs uh, when people come to our community and do that. So we had a few questions around council inquiries at our last meeting. One was around the various revenue sources. Uh, several of these are new. Uh, there are ones that we've enhanced in terms of uh, the revenue sources for 2020. Uh, and so you see uh, there they're listed. Burial permits is something that was privately held uh, and was transferred to the municipality in 2019. Marriage licenses and civil ceremonies, something we've started doing very recently in the last number of months. Uh, parking enforcement and the continued implementation of AMPS. You heard a presentation uh, from Mr. Smith uh, at the Planning Committee on Monday that uh, focused around parking enforcement and some of those data and revenue opportunities. Uh, facility advertising, that is something we're still, we're still doing. It's something that's still new. It's something we're still starting to see. Uh, and then through finance, uh, some new account setup fees. Uh, these projections are incremental in 2020. They do have long-term potential. We are gonna continue to see increased revenue in these particular area. Uh, and I will say that departments are regularly looking uh, at their revenue adjustments based on volume. Uh, we do this year round. We do this when we look at our fee increases uh, that are approved through council. Uh, we are constantly looking at revenues and making the necessary adjustments. Councilor Mikulik at our last meeting challenged us to be uh, as aggressive as possible when we look at revenue projections, uh, and uh, that is something that we uh, continue to do. <coughs> Chair Pachariva uh, asked us to look at long-term borrowing and what is falling off in the next three years. I have included on this slide uh, both uh, the next three years as well as beyond, uh, and uh, I think everyone uh, who was here last term uh, and this term uh, is familiar with most of these projects. Um, and the process, but typically projects come onto our books around two years after the project is approved uh, and the respective budget year. And the reason for that is just the timelines associated with approval, issuance, construction, and just the accounting issuance uh, and the accounting process associated with long-term borrowing. Uh, we presented uh, during our capital budget uh, that Lincoln remains in a strong ARL position, that is the annual repayment lettuce uh, the annual repayment limit status uh, and that the town of Lincoln experience is inclusive of this year's program. 4% uh, prior to this uh, year and the number of projects that we're looking at now moving up to 6% uh, inclusive of the projects. Uh, below uh, you will see a number of projects that are falling off in the associated years that they are coming off. Uh, the first three there coming off in 2020, Victoria Bridge, coming off in 2021. The Fleming Center land portion coming off in 2023. Those round out the three years, but beyond that we have Drake Academy and Diamond Building uh, coming off uh, in 2039, and then the Fleming Center construction being completed in 2046. Those are our external debt finance projects that are falling off. Uh, and then we also have projects uh, that are usually smaller in nature uh, and shorter in nature and shorter in duration that we fund through internal debt. Uh, and so in 2021, uh, the LED project and the LED lights are coming off as well as the Conco Creek land, uh, the Oakland Columbarium in 2024 and Mountain Street, Red Maple Bridge and Culp Road in 2033. We were asked a little bit about affordability uh, and our finance staff uh, did receive the most updated uh, study through BMA, which is a provincially uh, wide uh, study that occurs. Uh, and these are those numbers. Uh, they haven't changed significantly from last year and the last number of years in terms of where uh, Lincoln ranks from an affordability standpoint. Uh, and we are uh, non-inclusive of water and sewer, uh, th the third lowest uh, in terms of affordability uh, and the fourth lowest respectively when you include water and sewer 
uh, along with taxes. Uh, of course, this is based on uh, annual household income, and so it is a reflection that we are a community uh, that uh, does experience more affluency than uh, maybe some other communities, and that's why we do rank uh, near the top here or uh, in the bottom three, uh, probably better characterized uh, in terms of where we sit from an affordability standpoint. Over the last number of years, uh, and I think it was Councillor McPherson that asked us to, you know, remove the piece about uh, how affluent is our community and simply look at our competitiveness from a tax perspective. Uh, and so we don't have uh, the most updated calculator from the region, but the, the statistic based on the previous slide remains consistent. Uh, when we look at uh, property taxes uh, and we simply remove whether your property is assessed at 100K, 400K or 700K, uh, and you simply put in uh, what are taxes for the respective communities, uh, we still are below the average. Uh, and again, uh, on the right end uh, of the slide here of the graph in terms of property taxes. So our tax levy scenario uh, in terms of budget considerations, uh, from the last time we were here, I'm really gonna take you to the last point at the bottom, uh, and that is uh, staff were directed to go back uh, we were told to look at the budget. We were told to trim in certain areas. Uh, we did meet uh, both as a senior management team uh, as well as individually with finance and the respective departments to look at uh, where we could enhance revenues, where we could cut certain things, where we could use students and temporary staffing, and maybe some of those wouldn't be needed. Uh, one of the comments we got and, and heard from council at that time was uh, trying to mitigate uh, service cuts, uh, but rather go back and look at where we could cut the budget. Uh, over $350,000 was addressed in the budget uh, in terms of uh, where we were able to find cuts, uh, and those cuts happened in each and every department uh, through the various means, uh, again, with the goal being to limit service impacts as per council direction. As I highlighted, we looked at base operating budgets, we looked at where we could find reductions, uh, could we have lower usage, consumption, not, not go with as many summer students as we have, maybe do things a little bit differently. Uh, a lot of this constantly occurs. A lot of the conversations that senior management had was around these particular areas. Uh, how would we not impact service? How would we continue to address beautification, some of the parks programming we're doing, frequency of snow clearing, uh, on sidewalks, uh, grass cutting, all those sorts of things. Could we do it and could we do it with the least amount of impact and at the same time uh, achieving what council wanted us to do and that is lowering the budget. Uh, so we strengthened our revenue projections. Uh, we spent a good amount of time doing that as well. Uh, again, uh, some of our projections were very conservative so we went back, we looked at those uh, and our focus for 2020 will continue to be on revenue uh, and those revenue uh, targets. So the operating budget uh, following council direction uh, to trim sits at 3.4%. Our capital levy is approximately at 1.6% uh, for a town portion of 5%. Uh, our ABCs are coming in at 0.4% uh, and the majority of that being driven uh, through the library services uh, and our uh, Lincoln Public Library. And we have a special infrastructure levy of 1.5% to be put in reserves. Our total overall tax levy scenario therefore sits uh, here. Uh, it sits uh, at the various elements you've, uh, or we've identified here, revenues being at the top, uh, total revenues of uh, 33 million expenses, uh, our total expenses being at 27.9 uh, million, uh, and then we've included uh, transfers to reserves, agencies, boards, and commissions, uh, giving us a total uh, of what you have in front of you and the motion prepared for council. The 2020 distribution of taxes, once again, uh, is laid out for you there. Lincoln accounts for 37%. Niagara Region sits at 51% and education at 12%. Uh, we are responsible for one third of your tax bill, of our tax bill. Uh, the overall blended rate, based on what we're hearing from uh, Niagara Region, uh, pending any foreseeable changes that the region may have sits at 5.6%. Uh, 
uh, with Lincoln's portion being 2.5% on the overall tax bill. Every year we try to highlight for Council uh, both the value for tax dollar that residents get uh, in terms of the 90 programs and services that are highlighted there. Uh, and then we also share what is the impact uh, when you look at an average assessed home, uh, which in our community uh, is a little under $400,000, 388. Uh, and therefore the average impact to the taxpayer uh, is highlighted there from a yearly perspective at $262. Uh, all the way down to a daily perspective of 72 cents uh, or sometimes putting that into context about two coffees uh, per week so about five dollars per week we often share with council uh, this coin uh, which just lays out the various elements and how that one dollar is shared amongst the various departments uh, and as you can see here uh, we have uh, the various departments highlighted there Fire at 12, Planning and Municipal Enforcement at 5, Parks, Facilities, Rec and Culture at almost a quarter. Uh, similarly with Public Works, Roads and Infrastructure, ECDEV and Tourism at 3 cents. Uh, Council, CAO, HR, Communications, Clerks, Finance and IT, which we call Legislative and Administration at 9 cents. And the Capital Levy and Infrastructure Levy uh, at 17 cents. So. Uh, in terms of next steps, uh, we are looking at a budget communications rollout once Council does approve uh, the budget uh, and a tentative date of December 16th or Council this Monday is the date set for that, uh, again, pending uh, Council uh, decisions this evening. So I'm, I'm open to any questions uh, committee may have, uh, as is uh, the senior team. Any questions from Council? Council McPherson. Thank you, Chair uh, Patrieva, and um, uh, thank you for the presentation, Mike, and uh, good to be uh, at the operations slash capital budget. Missed a uh, little bit of time, but uh, caught up uh, quite nicely on YouTube and got uh, the gist of what had been discussed. So my question is going to go down that forecasting road. So, um, you know, looking at uh, kind of three areas uh, that we are looking at uh, changes, pretty significant changes uh, in uh, our tax revenue over the next, let's say, five years. So, um, First, first part of that is um, how, do, how are we or have we factored in uh, expected tax revenue from new home builds uh, in 2020 uh, or maybe, maybe new home builds in 2019 that we, we uh, have realized? And then I think with the growth that we're going to see over the next five years, is, is obviously going to be significant. You know, I think it's in our best interest to uh, know um, what impact those, those new uh, homes will have, positive impact, on our tax revenues over the next five years. Uh, if I can, I'm just going to finish the, the three areas and then we can go back. The next one is, is probably a more difficult one, and that is as we grow, uh, we're going to expect investment in our community. And uh, can we estimate uh, future tax revenue expected through the growth in our commercial, our industrial, and even our institutional uh, sectors as we move from 23,000 to 30,000 to 30, 35,000 people? How are we factoring that into our tax revenues year over year? And finally, uh, we know that uh, in 2020, MPAC is going to assess everybody's home. And I would uh, expect that uh, the homes here in Lincoln, knowing what we, we know about the retail change between 2016 and 2020, uh, we're going to all see a fairly significant change in the assessment value of our home, which will then obviously bring 
more revenue, tax revenue, without any tax uh, increases from the town of Lincoln. So that piece of it as well, you know, how are we factoring that into, obviously not this year's budget, but, and, and maybe not even next year's budget. Maybe, maybe it's, uh, it, it may be 2021, but uh, how are we looking at that as a positive uh, input in all those three areas to our tax revenues? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I think, uh, Councilor McCreason, I appreciate the question. I think it's it's an important question. It's a good question. And, you know, I think when we look at um, those projections, I think we do need to go out even further. We need to look at 2025, and, and I would suggest probably looking out to 2030 when we look at uh, some of our uh, more larger developments, I think, of Prudhams uh, and the duration of, of that project uh, at a seven to ten year horizon. Uh, I, I think we've started that work. Uh, we need to do more of it. Uh, I agree with you. I think a little bit of the uh, heavy build cycle is starting to happen right now. Some of it started last year and the year before. Uh, the way the tax process works, those will be coming on the books in 2020 and 21. I think we do our best to look at uh, what that looks like from a forecasting perspective. Uh, are we where I think I would like to be and council would like to be from a forecasting perspective? I, I don't think we're there yet, but I think we need to look at uh, multi-year forecasting. We need to look at what that means from a budget perspective. Uh, and so, I mean, uh, with, uh, with with both uh, the chair and and, uh, and soon to be vice chair's uh, thoughts, I think that is a, a, a committee we need to have, a, a special committee as a whole, a workshop that specifically looks at forecasting and what that means uh, from the perspective of assessment values, new dollars coming in. I mean, you highlighted the tax revenue piece, you've highlighted the growth and in investment uh, in terms of commercial, industrial, institutional, which is sometimes a little bit harder mm -hmm. to assess because we don't know what that looks like in those particular areas, but that's where we're gonna have the biggest impact in reversing the trend uh, that, that is currently on the taxpayer, probably two thirds to one third, and one third on those commercial, industrial, uh, and institutional areas, and so, uh, I, mean, I think, you know, my, my simple answer is, you know, we're, we're not doing it to the level we should be doing it. Uh, it is something as more building starts to take place that we will be looking at that forecasting uh, to give council, uh, I think, the comfort, uh, the consideration, especially as uh, more uh, significant projects come on, come on board. We have uh, the work happening in Jordan in terms of Main Street. Uh, we have uh, something potentially happening with the BDSS site. Uh, there's a number of key projects that are going to be coming on coming on board that uh, this will be important for us to look at uh, in terms of uh, everything from long-term borrowing uh, to taxes to sustainability. Uh, and through you, Mr. Cherry, uh, thank you, um, Mike, for that. And, and I think it's, it's important for us to see that as a separate item in future budgets that, that we can see... Um, how that is, how that is um, set, separated from our, our, our current, uh, every, you know, our current uh, total of tax revenue, just so that we can see the impact. Because uh, you know, I think you know, we're in a unique time in, in over the next five years or so, or, or maybe, maybe longer with the total build out of Prunums, but we're in a unique time uh, that uh, we're gonna see significant growth and that's going to end. At, at some point down the road. So we're, we're gonna be spending money um, looking at that growth and for us uh, as, a, as a staff and as a council to, to be a, able to identify what that, what that increased reven, revenue is coming in, I think will be helpful in uh, making decisions in those future years. Through you, Mr. Chair, I mean, staff will take that as, as direction, and I, and I think we'll come back and schedule early in the new year uh, a, a workshops of sorts, uh, I think, to start going through and, and explaining some of these things uh, better to council. I think we've got some ideas for additional uh, workshops as well uh, that we'll also uh, look to bring back. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I have one, one simple question. In previous budgets, we did get a, um, an org chart by department, but I didn't, see, I didn't see one in this year's budget. And it was helpful uh, to 
to see, you know, what, what do we have for, for employees and, and, you know, various uh, levels of each department. I, I think it's very helpful in us walking through this budget. So I, I would request that we get that. Um, through Mr. Through Chair, Mr. Chair, staff can work with uh, HR and, and finance to provide that to council. Thank you. Councilor McCluck. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to the CAO. Just, um, just to give me an idea, like, so, so, you know, we had various budget meetings and deliberations. What, uh, what sort of capital, there's various discussions and certain, uh, certain projects were brought up. What, what, what projects were considered by staff to possibly be, uh, was there, were there any cuts considered? Were there any with projects, with any operation? Like what sort of um, considerations were given to savings other than service? Uh, three, Mr. Chair, to, uh, to Councillor Mikulik. Uh, as it re relates to the uh, capital budget and the capital program, uh, staff did not go back and look at that capital list and suggest should we cut a particular project or should we not? Uh, I think as I answered at that particular point in time, and I will answer again for members of council, uh, the project, uh, the extensive list of projects you have before you are the projects uh, that staff are recommending that we believe are the right projects to recommend. Uh, when you look at uh, the funding sources for those, very little of it uh, falls to the levy. Approximately $64,000 is the increase from last year's levy to this year's levy as it relates to capital. So impact. Uh, from the perspective of uh, the levy uh, is not uh, so much what you feel from a capital perspective. So specifically to the capital list and the capital projects, staff did not go back uh, to look at that particular list and where to cut. I think we heard a lot of the comments and conversations around contingencies. We looked at uh, all of those sorts of things. We went back, we double checked. Uh, we looked at all the I's and T's that needed dotting and crossing respectively. But no, we did not go back uh, to the capital program per se and look at cutting any one of those projects, notwithstanding they wouldn't have an impact to the levy, Councillor. Thank you for that response. And through you, Mr. Chair, just the mm -hmm. uh, reason why I ask is a certain, with the governance review, there were certain items that were on that list that were considered to be possibly shared by or with other municipalities. Had, had that been entertained at all or was that just dismissed? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor, uh, all of those opportunities uh, have and, and continue to be entertained. Uh, I think if you're talking specifically about some of the fire ones, I'll let Chief Hudson speak to anything within our capital program uh, that may benefit from uh, any sort of shared services model. And then uh, following his answer, I can uh, provide uh, Council uh, through the Chair some comments uh, as it relates to shared services and our continued efforts to look at shared services. Are you through me, Mr. Chair? Yes, we did have uh, two items in particular that had opportunities to uh, share with other municipalities, one being the fire safety trailer and the other one was the uh, rehab slash decon unit. Uh, we're still entertaining um, or pursuing um, discussions with the uh, neighboring municipalities to further that. So just because uh, governance has uh, fallen off the table doesn't mean we're not going to pursue those opportunities to, to help offset some of our costs. And through you, Mr. Chair, I would echo the Chief's comments. I mean, those are the conversations uh, that are currently taking place with our neighbours, uh, both to the west uh, as well as to the south. Okay, well, all right. Mike, uh, the other question I have, uh, if I may, is mm -hmm. uh, with regards to, like, when I look at, let's say, operational and uh, these uh, uncontrollable costs that arise with the hiring of new staff. So we, we basically create a higher uncontrollable cost on a yearly basis with the addition of staff. Um, so my understanding at a couple of meetings ago with regards to at the community infrastructure, with regards to, in particular, one example, it would be the transportation coordinator. This is a position that it would appear on paper to be redundant in May. Um, 
can you speak to that and how what what where does that fall in to this budget uh, through you, mr chairman I, and i will uh i'll look to the clerk if i'm entering an area that that maybe requires us to go in camera so i will try to speak generally in terms of any position uh, that is deemed redundant uh, there is sometimes uh, so in this particular case uh, we are going to be entering into a new model as it looks to the provision of transit uh, tentatively without understanding the details from Niagara Region and an official start date to that. We are hearing May. Uh, it may be a little bit later. I think our promise to Council anytime we looked at any position was always to uh, ensure that that position uh, remains in place as long as the program remains in place. So there will be some overlap to make sure that transition uh, occurs properly uh, and occurs uh, in a fashion uh, that is best suited uh, both for the town as well as the region uh, and then we will be having conversations with the region on the possible transition uh, and or uh, any other conversation that that is required so if council does want to go in camera I can I can probably give you a more fulsome update uh, on that uh, and we can do that following this meeting should the chair uh, and members of council want me to go in camera on that uh, I, I wasn't planning on doing that at this time. It was just something that's public knowledge that uh, uh, that that you know. Through you, Mr. Chair, if I could, anytime there's an identifiable individual, mm -hmm. to, whether yeah. it's public knowledge or not, it, it yeah. enters into an area where it impacts yeah. that in, that particular individual. Mm -hmm. and, and so, my comment to council would be: anytime a temporary position is deemed redundant, uh, it, it, fairly self-explanatory that that position. Uh, also uh, has a start and an end date to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 through you, Councillor. I mean, if if we can have that discussion after and and you know shed light upon it, but we'll do it in a closed session. Fair okay, enough. later on this evening. So, okay, that's good for now. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, Mayor Easton. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm looking for an explanation. Um, in response to um, the uncontrollable costs and how they um, are connected to hiring, if the CAO would uh, could list uh, what those costs would be. Through you, Mr. Chair, and if I could, I, I think maybe just to pick up previously uh, on on Councillor Mikulik's question, I think it dovetails into uh, Mayor Easton's question. Uh, uncontrollable, I, I think sometimes we use that term. Uh, it's probably a term that we'll uh, uh, start uh, looking at maybe reframing and, and rephrasing. I think uh, there's always uh, elements of uncontrollable that are controllable. They just mean service impacts. They mean parting ways with uh, staff. They, they potentially look at those sorts of things. So I, I didn't want to leave that question without answering it. Now moving to, to the mayor's question, uh, you know, I, th I think there's, there's a number of things when we talk about uh, uncontrollable and we talk about hiring practices and we talk about uh, where positions assess that uh, and there's both a non-union and a union piece to that uh, there are grids and we've often talked about grids and progression through grids there's competitiveness uh, there is the associated uh, benefit allotments that often go with salaries and wages and so I think sometimes when we say a position receives 65,000 or 75,000 dollars that's not actually what's budgeted uh, the number is uh, higher than that because there is a benefit allotment piece to it uh, and there is uh, some legislative things through uh, the Employment Standards Act, through EI, uh, through Canada Pension that also go with that particular position. Those are elements of, of hiring uh, and salaries, wages and benefits. Sometimes it's seen as a line. It isn't just about the actual individual person making X amount of money. It's all those other pieces, some of which are driven uh, through other agencies, other levels uh, of government. Uh, wh where we put people uh, in grids, uh, some of that is negotiated if someone's coming from uh, external uh, into the organization. Uh, we have looked at our internal grids. We've also looked at things like cost of living. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, cost of living allowances and things that are negotiated within the settlements uh, aren't controllable. There are QP settlements uh, and we are part of a QP uh, unionized workforce. Uh, that is seeing settlements occur around us and so sometimes that is dictating what our settlements at whether it's 1.5 whether it's two uh, there's also you know a number of other I think you know complex elements that go into uh, the hiring process 
Uh, I think we've always tried to be an organization that looks at equity, that looks at what we pay people, uh, that looks at how we pay people. Uh, we are not the highest paid by any means. We are not the lowest paid by any means. We are in that, I would suggest, 40, 40 to 50 percent range in terms of uh, our competitors and where we're at. Uh, but if we look at where we're hiring from, uh, there are some uh, you know, unique elements to that. We're not just hiring from within the Niagara region. We're hiring outside the Niagara region. We're hiring within the GTA. Uh, and so I think those are all, uh, all respective factors. Uh, when we think of uncontrollable, when we think of uh, the staffing costs that go into that, uh, professional development, training and education are other elements uh, as our wastewater treatment system uh, evolves and changes to serve our community and the growing needs. A number of our staff are moving to level three and other sorts of training. And so there's those pieces uh, that ultimately result with increased training, uh, increases to pay. Uh, some of that is funded through our rate budget uh, but nonetheless, there's a, a number of complicating factors that go into our grids and, and how we pay people. Uh, and again, I think, you know, an area where we could uh, probably share more with council uh, so that council can, you know, have a better comfort and a better understanding of, of what that looks like. So, Mr. Chairman, it's just as I suspected. There's nothing about what you told us that is not known, that we don't plan for, and... I don't, I still don't understand which part of it is uncontrollable. Um, so I, I, I think we need to be clear that we aren't making decisions about hiring staff and then worrying about what the benefit package is like. If the benefit package is getting out of control and we feel that we need to put that out um, for an RFP, then we do that so that it benefits the entire corporation. So I, I don't understand, with all due respect to the councillor, I don't understand what these uncontrolled costs are, but I do want to make sure that there's no misunderstanding at the public level, because everything that you listed for us is something that, um, that we already consider. And if we cannot afford those things, then we're clearly not hiring. And I think it's one of the reasons why there was about a 12-year span here where there was no hiring. It could very well have had something to do with all of those things. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm still mystified by this number related to long-term borrowing, and I want to make sure that we deal with it. So on, in the new document, in the version two, I think it's the third page in counting the cover, and it says that the long-term borrowing charges are a million fifty-eight thousand, and that they represent three percent, three percent of projected spending. And I just want to make sure that the statement then that you made later on in the budget that talks about the um, the borrowing, um, the planning for borrowing, generally doesn't kick in for at least two years uh, into possibly the end of the project. And certainly that was the case with the Fleming Centre for, for sure. So why are we worrying about the total um, cost of long-term borrowing in 2020 when we know that those charges are going to come later? We need to be concerned about them in terms of the aggregate. But that is not, unless you're telling us something here that I don't understand, these charges are not, this is not this year's charge, or is it just this year's charge? Because I want to make sure that these two things are reconciled. This is the, if I remember correctly, this was the, the swan dive that used to scare the living daylights out of councils here in Lincoln because the long-term borrowing for years and years and years was, was described and was put forward in annual budgets when very little of it actually had to do with, with the budget. So could we have a clear description of that? So through you, Mr. Chair, I, I will do my best to provide uh, that clarity. Uh, so through you to the mayor uh, and to her particular question. Uh, am I worried and should council be worried about our long-term borrowing? Uh, I think I've said on numerous occasions uh, the answer is no. Uh, this council, previous councils for a number of years have set very 
uh, aggressive targets have been very focused on ensuring uh, that if we take on debt, if we look at long-term borrowing, uh, it is the right type of borrowing for the right project and our limits are uh, and remain very low. 10% is that limit we've set. Many municipalities are now uh, shying away from 10 and actually moving to 15. The provincial average is 25. A number of our comparators in Niagara of similar size uh, are considerably higher than where we were at. We are undergoing a growth phase and so we will be taking on more projects, but as I've highlighted, uh, almost a dozen projects are falling off uh, within the next uh, number of years. This 3% that you see on this particular slide uh, is just uh, an amount uh, converted into percentages of what the $1 million of this year's budget uh, that is long-term borrowing charges uh, that will that have come from projects in past years uh, will cost us. So it's not indicative of 3% added to the 4% in terms of where we're currently sitting. It is simply uh, an aggregate amount of the $1,058,712 that is here. Uh, in terms of where we sit and how municipalities measure debt, we look at our annual repayment limits in terms of what we can afford, and that is where we are sitting at 4%. Even looking at the number of projects this year and a higher than average uh, amount of debt that we look to take on or long-term borrowing, we still remain well below our average and well below uh, the regional average uh, and those said limits. And so, Mr. Chairman, when we look at the funding sources, the future long-term borrowing, could we have an explanation of, of that? Line, Through you, Mr. Chair, to the Mayor, uh, we are looking at uh, having an additional $10 million in long-term borrowing to fund this year's program, uh, of which that is incorporated into the 6%. So as you recall, when we were looking at the capital program and how we would fund the approximate $30 million in our capital program, reserves uh, accounted for uh, 7.9 million, DCs 9.8 million, and long-term borrowing 10 million. The lion's share of that long-term borrowing project being the work at the, uh, with respect to the pipe uh, to service our Prudhomme's development. Uh, and so that number is simply the long-term borrowing that will be approved as per this particular capital program. Uh, again, the 33% is only an aggregate uh, of the funding sources, they're not indicative of 33% in uh, an addition to that 4% that we're currently sitting at, so. Okay, that's great, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, may I make a comment about, um, may, may I make a comment? You may. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I think the comments uh, earlier around uh, the financial sustainability um, and um, uh, spending some time in that area in, in the next um, fiscal year. I, I hope starting with quarter one is going to be very important. We, we have a financial sustainability intention, uh, but to start to see that now that uh, real money is coming forward and um, work is getting completed is going to be extremely important. We wanna make sure that we remain in a very, very good um, financial position in the future. However, the discussion about commercial, um, industrial, um, and institutional is very important from an economic development perspective, and I hope that um, we'll be able to attract um, some very robust uh, businesses, something entirely different than maybe what we are accustomed to seeing uh, because, uh, and we're doing that. I think that we're talking about how we're doing that. We've made quite an investment in making our community more attractive. We are open for business. Um, and I think um, having uh, attractive retail will also attract um, more local um, choice and more local purchasing. And I would put the uh, CIPs uh, and those initiatives uh, into that category as well, because I think it all it all adds up to the same uh, same result. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Your button. Thank you, Vice Chair Russell. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to the presenter. Um, Mr. CAO, I wonder if you could just uh, speak to or give us a little recap of the $350,000 reduction in the tax levy, might, what might be included in that, and then I will likely have a follow-up. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I am looking for the slide, but uh, I, I don't necessarily need the slide. I can definitely speak to it. Uh, uh, I do have a breakdown in terms of each department, but uh, I think you know the summary is pr approximately uh, thirty to forty thousand uh, dollars. Looking at each of the particular departments and divisions that was able to be found, uh, we went back uh, and didn't necessarily look at it from the perspective of a target like that, but said if we were to cut two or three percent uh, from where the budget is currently sitting at, how would we do that? Where would we do that? Uh, and I think the lens we tried to bring to that councilor uh, was specifically around. Uh, what we heard from council at that meeting, and that is uh, the least amount of impact to services because it's never services we want to look at. Uh, some of that uh, is definitely uh, looking at our revenue projections uh, and looking at uh, everything from byline planning and development, looking at uh, some of the permit fees collected through legislative services. Uh, Chief Hudson uh, and our fire service similarly went through their assessment of fees. Uh, the CAO's office did that, uh, our community services department did that as well, as did finance. So we were able to, uh, I would suggest, come up with probably uh, more than half uh, through looking at potential revenue and then uh, conversation specifically with public works uh, and community services in terms of the number of students we employ uh, and the roles that those students play in the summer in terms of beautification, uh, grass cutting, uh, cemeteries, uh, in a number of other uh, areas and determining could we still provide the same level of service uh, without those increases to those particular hours. And I, I, that's how we've come up with the number. Uh, we think it's a number that um, in terms of about 359,000 uh, that was cut. Uh, the, the chair uh, mentioned at the beginning that uh, chasing down 2% uh, is, is a lot harder on the budget in terms of cutting 359,000 than it is the $4.37 uh, that, or $4.37 uh, that is attributed for that 1% uh, or double that for 2%. So really it's come from those particular areas. We've looked at revenues, the CAO's office uh, as well in terms of uh, advertising, in terms of uh, some of our uh, other stretch goals. Uh, and so we will be working hard to meet those uh, revenue projections uh, up this year because they are very aggressive. Follow up to that, uh -huh. Mr. Chair. Um, again, uh, looking at those revenue projections, they didn't, uh, there is uh, quite, a, quite a big steep uh, increase. So I'm just wondering process-wise, what happens if we don't hit those projections and how will that maybe uh, affect this year's budget or will that be carried over to next year's? Just process more or less. Yeah. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, it, we, we always come to you at the end of the year uh, and, and determine, uh, you know, have we met projections? Have we met targets? Uh, and often that's why municipalities have what we call those uh, stabilization reserves. Uh, the town of Lincoln similarly has one. Uh, it is in a fairly healthy position as well. So uh, if we don't meet targets, if we don't meet those things, uh, we, not like other levels of government, uh, can't run deficits. Uh, we have to balance our budget each and every year uh, to the penny. Uh, and so if we are short, uh, we will look at the reserves we have in place to offset them. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Councillor Brene. Thank you, Chair Patriba. Through you to uh, Mr. Kirkopoulos. So, Mike, thank you for the work that staff has done to get us where we are to tonight. Um, I, I wanted to go down. Um, my comments coming into tonight were going to be similar to Councillor McPherson's. Is, is you know we, We've said over and over throughout this process that this is a growth budget. I wouldn't argue that. Um, you know, taking the prudence aside for right now, because I believe that is, you know, a long-term project that's going to go out probably seven to ten years. So, you know, when you look beyond, you know, the Vista Bridge and, and the Lincoln Estates and the Cache and the FBH that we're doing that are probably going to be all completed in the next, you know, 18 months or so, um, you know, I'm concerned and, and, I, and I'm hoping you can put my mind at ease or at least speak to it that, um, and, and I'm not uh, I'm not trying to be, you know, accusational or anything like that. I'm, I'm just asking because uh, as a council, I, I'm not sure we have all the information. But, you know, it's my understanding is that as a council, uh, you know, we're going to have to make a commitment, at least in writing, to the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital in the first queue, first quarter of 2020 as to our commitment as a municipality. And that, uh, 
you know, when you look at what's happening on the site of the, of the, of the new mega school, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, in 2020, we're gonna be at the table with some serious decisions on, on the current BDSS site. So my, my only comment through you, Mr. Chair, is that, um, you know, are we opening ourselves up as we go into this budget, which is very aggressive and is a growth budget, we, we all would agree on that, is that we have not had enough discussion um, and again, this is a hypothetical question that we've had not not had enough discussion uh, to look at that because I would hate to, you know, go into 2020 and then all of a sudden we're at the table having some serious discussions about these two major, you know, um, items that are going to impact us moving forward, and and then hear from our residents that you know you you approved the budget knowing these were coming down the pipe. Um, so I'm, I'm just putting it out there. I'm wondering if you could speak to those two items. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to Councillor Brene. Um, so let, let me tackle the hospital first. Uh, the councillor uh, is correct uh, that uh, notwithstanding uh, any changes uh, to the provincial process uh, and any response back that we receive uh, that is not positive as we in indicate or uh, as we believe it will be, uh, the hospital project, West Lincoln Memorial, uh, will move to the next phase. The next phase is where uh, municipalities are going to be asked to make uh, a commitment uh, and that commitment will be uh, the local cost sharing uh, and there are a number of ways to look at how you slice up that particular pie uh, but each of the three municipalities that make up uh, West Niagara will be asked to contribute as will uh, Niagara region uh, again how we split that up uh, and what uh, portion of that uh, is made up through philanthropy is made up through fundraising is made up through the hospital itself uh, I can definitely give you an estimate that uh, the hospital is looking at approximately a 150 to 200 million dollar build. The, the cost sharing uh, or what we call the local cost sharing is 30 percent so that takes you to 60 million dollars. Uh, of that there are monies that are currently set aside both from a municipal standpoint and a foundation standpoint uh, that probably equate to about a quarter of that uh, and so then again I think if you look at the capacity to fundraise and so forth uh, there are numbers that are being, I think, bantied around uh, that each municipality may have to look at anywhere from five to ten million dollars in terms of contribution uh, over a, a long-term plan. Uh, Hamilton Health Sciences has brought on uh, experts from KPMG that specifically deal with hospital fundraising to work with each of the three municipalities. We have had one introductory meeting at this particular point in time at, of which uh, Mayor Easton and the mayors from uh, all three West Niagara municipalities were also at. Uh, we've been given a worksheet to go through uh, and KPMG will be looking at each municipality uh, and determining what is the best course of action uh, to look at funding uh, for a West Lincoln Memorial Hospital uh, rebuild should there be a need for us to fill the gap that isn't able to be raised from fundraising. None of that money will be due until the hospital is complete. And if we look at a 2022 issuance of an RFP and a build, we're probably <coughs> looking at 2025, 26, potentially by the time all of this is complete. So Councillor, uh, you know, we are aware of it. We are cognizant of it. Staff are looking at that as we look at our projections and what that means from a, uh, a, a, a an ARL perspective uh, and how that plays into some of the other projects that we have. Uh, again, not knowing the amount, we are dealing with particular ranges, but you will start to hear, I think, more of this early in the new year. Uh, my colleagues from both municipalities in the West are having similar conversations, I think, with their respective councils or will be early in the new year, uh, again, to, I think, socialize the community to this. There is a renaissance in the community uh, in terms of will the hospital get built, and so I think uh, while it's premature, it's an important conversation for us to be having. Uh, your second question around BDSS. Uh, absolutely, that will be similarly an opportunity that we will have uh, before us. Uh, the process for BDSS is uh, 90 days before it's deemed surplus, so when kids move out uh, and the new school opens, 90 days back from that uh, is when we would have to uh, enter into uh, an agreement. Uh, there are a number of ways to look at that agreement as well. Uh, I would like and, and want council direction uh, to begin that negotiation process sooner rather than later to tie in uh, a particular price for that. Uh, again, without getting into the details of what that negotiation uh, may particularly look like, I think it will be to the benefit uh, of the municipality to enter into that agreement. And so any costs associated with that uh, and the potential business case that looks at this building, looks at some of our other holdings uh, and what we do uh, have been incorporated 
into our thinking. Uh, we have run, again, internally, counselors, some numbers on what our ARL will look like. It will definitely peak uh, at 10%, maybe going up to 11% and then come back down. Uh, if we were to take on these projects, again, the numbers really are estimates at this point. Uh, there are different ways to look at the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital piece. It could be a specific levy, like some municipalities are looking at. It can be long-term borrowing, or it can be a combination uh, of both. But I do want to put your mind at ease, Councillor, that we are cognizant of these, as well as all the projects that we've got uh, on the horizon. Uh, staff are looking at them. They're looking at the potential revenue, what we can afford population growth. So as much as we haven't had the, the forecasting to the level of specificity that I think we'd like, um, when we were looking at financial sustainability, and you recall Chris McQueen uh, presented uh, from Disruptive uh, Ideologies, uh, presented uh, something on uh, what is uh, a long-term financial sustainability plan. Uh, within that document, we were talking about some of these projects and what they would look like and what that would mean as we start to look at uh, our debt. So uh, I can assure you, Council, we are aware of that. Uh, we are taking it into consideration, uh, and these will be things, you're right, that early in 2020 we will be before Council on both of those. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mike, for, for that. And in, in no way, in shape or form, was I insinuating that we're living in a bubble and not thinking about it. I just wanted to make sure that we're we're articulating that uh, you know we are visionary, that we are looking down the road, and that uh, as we make these decisions in the 2020 budget, uh, you know we're very cognizant that we have these things coming down the road. So I appreciate your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Councillor McCluck. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to speak again. I just, um, you know, it's uh, I've said it before in past budgets where a certain element of trust that uh, council places upon yourself and then you place upon your staff. When I go to the dentist, I don't tell my dentist, listen, this is what I got to spend, do what you can. I trust my dentist to tell me what I need, do what he's got to do, and you know, hopefully respect my dollar. And that's basically the comment I'm trying to make and hoping that uh, we're doing with this budget. and yourself and staff knowing the community and what what the needs and the wants are and the hopes are I'm, I'm hoping that this budget will address all of those concerns thank you through you mr. chair if I could to, to, to councillor Michalik's uh, comment um, you know I think one of the things that that council early on and uh, I just passed my four-year anniversary on December 14th uh, with the town of Lincoln uh, and or sorry, that's coming up, sorry. I didn't just pass it, it's coming up. I'm thinking it's December 16th already. I'm already getting to approval, um, so I shouldn't get ahead of myself. Uh, so December 14th is four years for me. One of the things that this council and a number of the faces on this council remain the same, uh, and I do recall the last, uh, the last comment that the mayor made uh, before we agreed or I agreed or I took the offer or whatever order all of that happened and uh, that really, uh, I think, sold me on you know, wanting to be the CAO here uh, and hopefully sold you throughout the process and that was around building trust and confidence. Uh, and I think council put that trust and confidence uh, into me, uh, into moving this community forward, uh, moving this organization forward and uh, I hope we've done that. Uh, you do have a senior leadership team uh, that is smart, that is passionate, that is committed, uh, that works uh, tirelessly, I think, to deliver those services. So. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, Mr. Chair, uh, and I appreciate the councillor's comments. Uh, so I think he's comparing me to his dentist, is what he's saying. A soliloquy or question? No, question. Council McPherson. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, Looking at the uh, looking at the presentation tonight, Mike, under capital tax levy, we've got uh, a little over two million dollars. And when I go back to the presentation that was made uh, earlier, our capital tax levy was a million four. So uh, I know I was away, but uh, do we know what the six hundred thousand dollar difference is in those two numbers? I'm looking at the pie chart that was presented 
back when capital was uh, first brought up. This goes back to probably the first presentation. Through you, Mr. Chair. So I, I have the slide here that speaks to the capital tax levy being at $2 million. I'm going to look to Rosalie. Uh, I think she is playing a bit of catch up with Terry being off. Uh, but she looks like she's ready to, to provide an answer on how we've captured it in this summary slide versus what it was on the pie graph, or at least I'm hoping she is. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor, yes. Um, I have Terry on speed dial, our faithful treasurer, so she's helping me. Fabulous. And uh, she just let me know that um, the long-term borrowing charges were not included um, in the cap tax Levy the capital levy on the last uh, the last presentation, but they are included now. Okay, that does it. Um, and uh, I, I guess I'm just uh, I'm doing some math in in the uh, in the total blended tax rate, and I guess. My question, I, I see ours is, ours is 6.9 now. Uh, so what are we assuming the, uh, the region and the, the uh, school boards coming in at to get, I think, a, a blended of 5.6? Is that what uh, you presented tonight? Uh, three, Mr. Chair, that is correct in terms of what we've presented. Uh, the region actually has uh, approved at a committee level 5.85. Okay. Uh, I know they are looking uh, potentially at adding a little bit more money uh, with respect to the SNP program, so their incentive program. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know where that goes in terms of the ratification, and uh, I believe that's tomorrow uh, that they're looking at that. Uh, that $600,000 from a regional perspective won't add a huge amount to the 5.85. It may approach close to six. Should they decide to do that uh, and education, uh, our best estimates from the respective education number uh, is that it is remaining uh, where it currently is at, uh, although uh, Rosalie may have an update on that. So our numbers are, are fairly specific in terms of uh, where we're getting them from. So it does incorporate uh, our 6.9, uh, the region's 5.85, and education, which sits at? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. The, um Education right now we have estimated at zero percent. We haven't received any communication yet from the province regarding education. Um, however, last year, that being said, our treasurer let me know that they actually uh, projected a decrease last year. So we don't expect an increase. Hmm. And we won't know that until... I don't it's, have the answer I, to I that question. I mean, it's question. a small number. Yes. It's 12 percent, so it's not it's not a big hit, um, you know, unless they came through with a double-digit increase. But uh. through uh, through the chair to counselor, um, in the past, the educational levies, any changes, increases, decreases have been extremely small. Mm -hmm. So we're expecting zero to nominal. So basically, the math is is R five R six nine. The uh, region's 585 results in 56 total. Through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. However, that math works. Yes. It's a bit odd. A bit odd that it's the lowest number. Yeah. So, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the, I mean, as much as we dismiss the education portion, uh, it does a, equate to about 12%, so a 0% increase on the 12%. And so, if you multiply, 50% uh, times the region's 5.85, and you add 50% uh, times, or 30% times our uh, 6.9, uh, and then uh, a 0% increase on the 12% of it, uh, you do get that blended rate. Very good, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Any other questions or comments from committee? I've got a few. Um, having this been my second budget and 16th year of doing budgets, um, I'd like to make some recommendations going forward as I turn the role over to my vice chair. There was a time when I started on council where we went line by line. Is that the way to go? No. 
But you heard around the table tonight that uh, information is knowledge, and we're all on the same team. And when questioned at the grocery store, or the gas station, or the arena, or the ball diamond, we need to be able to have an intelligent conversation with our residents. We need to tell them what they need to hear, but we need to know the answers ourselves. So we need to immediately start looking at multi-year budgets. This snapshot of one year at a time isn't serving us in the role that we're facing with growth. We've all asked for that top of the bell and then the downward slide. And what's that going to look like? And how's that going to impact us? And how are these debt things coming on? West Link Memorial Hospital, BDSS, Prudhams, 4th Ave, not 4th Ave, 19th Street and Main Street. These are all coming down and we can't stick our heads in the sand and say they'll go away because they're not. So, and I, I sent some, some snapshots from the 2009 and the 2013 budget on how we were dealing with long-term debt and the, the project and the year that it was coming off and the amount that we were budgeting. So then looking at these new items, how they come on. So we've got to look out five years as these projects come on and we can see where debt's going and we can have that informed conversation and we know what the number is. You guys have ran some projections and staff, but we're not, we just see them on a graph. We need to know what the numbers are so we can be involved in the conversation. Um, the budget's gone from uh, a lot of numbers to more of a text-based scenario. And there's times when, when charts and graphs, and you heard it tonight on, on, well, where did those cuts come from? People need to see them. You can't just lump them together. Tell us what the revenue stream additions are. Tell us what the cuts are. Um, a bunch of the counselors around the table have been involved in the business community. And again, when I see that wages are an incontrollable cost, wages are always controllable, whether it's based on number of people. And this is where that we are entrusted with the public purse, and we need to be delivering value for the tax dollar. So, when we talk to, you know, when we talk to the, the uh, when I used to talk to the, the bag boy at the store or the cashier, you're the touch point with the customer, and the taxpayer is no different. So if they see three people standing around, they feel as if they're not getting value for the dollar. So we need to be diligent. As we can't be driving around and ignoring things that we see. We need to, you know, say to always someone, it doesn't matter what peg you are on that rung. You play a valuable role. And encourage thought and encourage constant um, communication, encourage new ways of doing things. And don't be afraid or shy or summarily dismiss them because they're not seen within the scope of the way that we do things. If there's a different and a better way to do them, then let's be open. Let's be transparent and let's embrace innovation because operations aren't going away. Operations are cont going to continue to be the crux of all budgets as we go forward. Because as we get bigger, we're going to add manpower or women power. And we're going to add equipment. And we're going to need to deliver those services in a costly and a time effective manner. So, Mr. CAO, I would entrust you to take those recommendations for Vice Chair Russell and. Uh, I will, be your, I will be your beard, my friend, next year, and help you. And, you know, we should also, an, another recommendation would be uh, the chair and the vice chair work together with staff to establish some targets. We had these come around at, in our discussions, and, 
And what are the targets we're setting? Well, we don't really have that. And a lot of other communities have a, have a budget committee. So sit down and work together and say, okay, um, here's your pool, here's your targets. If you can get there, tell us you can get there. If you can't, tell us you can't. But there needs to be more involvement in the process. It can't just be stick handling at the end of the game. So, Vice Chair Russell, you are up. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, for that uh, nice warm handoff as well. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your yeoman's work this past year on this, uh, and also the CAO and the staff for putting this together. Um, I do look forward to the updates as we kind of progress through the year. I'd like to take uh, the Chair's notes. And uh, again, I know there's a recommendation to bring the budget process in earlier in the year, get the discussion going early, so it's not left to uh, the last few months of the year. So I think that's, there's going to be some big steps, and I look forward to seeing what that progress is to try to get that multi-year budget in process and uh, see where, again, we can start seeing some of those curvatures of the bells and, uh, again, remediate any issues uh, before they become problems. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to you and uh, Vice Chair Russell. Uh, you did meet with staff on a number of occasions over the last uh, two to three weeks, uh, and so that was also appreciated uh, as well. Okay, so I see no further questions. So I've got a motion. Whereas the Council of the Town of Lincoln have evaluated the overall requirements for the Town of Lincoln to ensure the efficient delivery of municipal services to the ratepayers of the Town of Lincoln. Now therefore be it resolved that the 2020 capital budget expenditures of $31,226,987 be approved. And further, that the 2020 operating budget be approved with the tax levy requirement of $18,033,487 for local municipal purposes. And further, that the Council of the Town of Lincoln direct staff to prepare the annual taxation levying bylaw as required by the Municipal Act 2001 upon the setting of the tax ratios and requisition amounts by the Regional Municipality of Niagara and other applicable bodies. We will require a mover for the motion, Vice Chair Russell. All those in favor? Any opposed? And that is carried. I see no confidential items. Any staff remarks, Mr. CAO? Uh, three, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, th I think as I said previously, I, I did want to thank you and uh, our Vice Chair and all of Council uh, for your attention, your questions, reaching out to me. Uh, almost daily on the budget uh, and talking about the budget uh, I think always helps us uh, prepare better and, and to the staff and the senior leadership team uh, that really uh, did the lion's share of the work. Thank you. Any committee remarks? No, I, I, I had one more that I, re I was remiss in my wrap up is um, and I know some of the other councillors were looking forward to this as I would see if I could get that 10-year capital plan back on the horizon again as we go to the multi-year budgets, which lays out a framework of, of anticipating what's coming. So there being no further business, I call this meeting adjourned. <laughs>